do is care for you. You act like I don't even matter. I'm, I'm sorry. I, all I'm asking for is a second chance. There are no more second chances. morning. How's everybody doing today? Good. I want to welcome everyone who's watching by video as well. Hi, Mom. She's live streaming in from Michigan. Um, we're in a series called I Deserve It. We're looking at stories in the Bible where characters who would actually deserved one thing, but by the grace of Jesus, they got something entirely different. How many, like the guy in the video, like the friend, could say they felt like they needed another chance and that they've been counted out at least once in their life? All right? All of us have been there at some point. So we're going to be talking about that personal failure today where we feel like we've let ourselves down, where you feel like you've let someone else down, or you feel like you've even let God down. And because we didn't perform to a certain standard, we feel like we're ready to give up on ourselves, or we feel like God has given up on us. Like we're done, and there are no more chances. But before we get into today's message, uh, let's get our hearts ready to receive. So if y'all could repeat after me, today... I will hear the voice of God God. through the word of God. God. My eyes will be enlightened. enlightened. I will be changed. changed. Well, I didn't feel like it would be right to start a message without a Pastor James story. Who wants to hear a Pastor James story? All right. He gave me permission, so. Uh, Pastor James is probably one of the most competitive people I know. Um, We used to do student ministries together up in Michigan, and it was uh, pretty funny to, to watch him play games with the students. We play a lot of games in student ministries. And you could tell he was always biting at the bit to just, like, unleash his competitive monster that's in him. And um, he was always trying to hold back. Because, you know, students go to student ministries to, to be encouraged, right? They don't want them going home feeling defeated. And uh, so Pastor James usually took it pretty easy. And uh, one day we, we got into a game called Foursquare at student ministries. Is that anyone familiar with Foursquare? Yeah? Well, there's a, there's a big square on the ground. It's divided into four smaller squares. And every player has a square that they have to guard. And if the ball hits in their court, they have to return it, kind of like tennis. And if they, if they would miss, then they're out. And uh, we would, the leaders of, of the student ministries, we were actually like so into this game, we would come in on our nights off when there was no student ministries and play this game. We were that into it. And uh, so the students would come and they would play, and Pastor James would take it easy on them. And uh, every now and then, one of the students would just get, you know, to bragging and start talking smack just a little too much. And then you would just see that Pastor James' competitive monster just come out and unleash, and you're just like, rah! And hit the ball, and the student would be like this, and the ball would just go, (laughs) And the student would start to walk off, feeling defeated, you know, little tears at their eyes. Pastor James beat me up. And um, Pastor James would say, wait! you get another try. And he, in, every, if on the serve, if you miss the ball, you would actually get another try as part of the rules. But he would always say it like, you get another try. Every single time. It's like, wait, you get another try. Every single time. It was actually kind of weird. Um, yeah. But let's all say that together. You get another try. All right. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Well, sometimes it's not so easy to get another try. I remember in the summers when I was in high school, I used to work with my dad uh, building homes, like doing the rough carpentry work, framing in the walls, putting the walls up, putting the trusses on, sheeting the roof, uh, doing hard work. And for a, for a teenager, like your summers, like that's like your golden time. Like those are your times where you want to have fun. So um, there's one particular day, um, my friends were all out doing something fun and I was stuck at work. And I was like kind of moping around about it and I really started to get to me, and I started complaining to my dad. I started making smart remarks, like, oh, I could be out doing this, and said, I'm here doing this. And at one point, my dad had enough, and he said, fine, you don't have to come in tomorrow, or any day after that. And I was like, did my dad just fire me? I think he did. And for a 16-year-old who who doesn't like their job, you know, getting fired is not the biggest deal. Like, you know, you don't have bills, you live at home. 
But when you live at home with your ex-boss, it's kind of a big deal. Um, you know, when things were, out, were good between me and my dad, but it wasn't until years later where I grew up a lot, and uh, I actually went back to work for him, and our relationship actually grew a lot closer because of it. But I'd let my dad down in that season, and I pulled away from uh, him to go do my own thing. But it's kind of funny to look back to say, hey, my dad fired me, and our relationship's great now, but... Um, sometimes our failures are not so funny. You know, we make promises to ourselves, we make promises to God, uh, we make compromises, we neglect things. You know, maybe you were hard on your kids for years and now that they're older, they will have nothing to do with you. Or maybe you have a financial debt that's caught up with you. Or maybe you have dreams that were missed and you thought by this time in your life you would be somewhere different, doing something different, where you woke up one day and you said to yourself, you don't know how you got here. And we're going to be looking at one such story in the Bible today, and that's the story of Peter's denial. Um, This is one of those stories I feel like just stands out. Like if you think about being let down, or you feel like you've been counted out, this story stands out in the Bible. And I think if we look at it today, we're going to have a few things that we can learn from it. Uh, So to give you a little bit of background before we get into the scriptures about Peter, Peter was a fisherman, and uh, Jesus called him out of fishing Uh, to follow him, to do ministry with him. He did ministry with Jesus for three years. He saw Jesus' miracles. He listened to his teachings. He was part of the inner core of disciples. He got to hear things even the other disciples didn't get to hear. And uh, he's traveling with Jesus. They're on their way to Jerusalem for the Passover. Jesus had just raised Lazarus from the dead, and things are looking good for Jesus' ministry. Things are looking good for his disciples, right? Because if Jesus is going good for Jesus, it's going good for his disciples. And uh, he rides into the city. The whole city's cheering for him. He's on the donkey. Everyone's cheering for him. And literally everyone who believed in Jesus was expecting him to set up the kingdom of God on earth. They literally thought he was going to be their king and rule over the nations, including his disciples. And his disciples wanted this to happen because they were right, Jesus' right-hand men, They'd be like his presidential cabinet. But little did they know that this would actually be um, one of their last moments with Jesus before he went to the cross. It was Thursday night. They're in the upper room. They're eating the Last Supper. And Jesus just told them that he's going to die and then he's going to rise again. But his disciples, it it didn't make any sense to them. Like They're totally expecting this kingdom to come on earth. How could you die, right? So there's totally over their head. And that's where we're going to pick up with our story today. So let's go to Luke 22, verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen my brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you deny three times that you know me. Now, there's, there's a lot in the scripture here, and I, prob- I actually had trouble moving on from the scripture when I was doing these notes. There's a lot in here that I think will help us stay out of the letdown. And the very first thing that we can recognize from the scripture is God has a pattern. We can recognize his pattern. All throughout the Bible, even the Old Testament, God would constantly warn his people when there was trouble coming. Go through there, look for it. The God's mercy is all string throughout the Old Testament. He would warn the people if they were doing something stupid, look, this is going to hurt you in the end. And we see Jesus doing the same thing. He's telling Peter, look, tonight it's about about to get crazy tonight, and I'm concerned about you. I'm concerned about how you're going to handle this. And Peter, uh, he didn't listen. And just like Peter, I feel like we have a hard time listening to to the warnings of God, listening to his word to us, either because we think we know better or because it kind of hurts too much. Like, have you ever been corrected before? It kind of stings a little bit. Like, hey, I think things would go a lot smoother if you would just communicate a little bit more, you know? Like, "Uh, that doesn't feel too good. Or, hey, I don't think you should have done it that way, but you should have done it like this instead. And it's like, don't tell me what to do, right? It kind of stings a little bit when we're corrected, but we shouldn't be surprised when it, when, when, it, when it does because Jesus had told us that every branch that's connected to him, that's you and me, when we're connected with Jesus, that we're going to get pruned so that we bear more fruit. 
He's saying that everything that's in you that that doesn't bear fruit is going to be cut away. And that's the part that stings. And it's God's word. When we're in God's word, that's what prunes us. That's what cleans us. Um, You know, when we're reading the Bible and we get to those scriptures that say, oh, pray for your enemies. It kind of seems like, I'll skip over that one. That one's too hard. (laughs) Yes, some people have torn a lot of their Bibles. But those are the ones we actually need to be reading twice because that's the Lord speaking to us. It's the Lord wanting to help us. When we read the scripture, it's got to be a mirror. Where am I with this scripture? How is it being applied to my life? We need to listen. Uh, The second thing that we can recognize about his pattern is that he always has a plan B. And you can see this all throughout the scriptures as well. The Lord always has a plan B for when we make mistakes, when we have our failures. He already knows. It's not a surprise to him. God is not surprised by our mistakes. And even so, he still chose to love us. So even here, he's saying to Peter, look, I know you're going to mess up, man. You're going to make a mistake tonight. But once you're past it, once you're finally over it, return to me and do that very thing that I've called you to do. So basically, Jesus is saying, you get another try. Come on, say it one more time. Amen. And I wrote this down this morning. We can't think that we're too gone for him to fix. That would saying that our situation is stronger than God, right? God already has a plan B. He already has a way back. Our second tendency here is we need to recognize is, or the second thing we need to recognize is our tendency. Often, we are too quick to respond. We often say things without thinking or say things without really counting the cost, and we see Peter doing that. Instead of listening, he responds to Jesus. No, no, Jesus, not me. Maybe them, maybe the other disciples. I'll go to jail with you, Jesus. We can share a cell. We can get matching tattoos, right? We can start a prison ministry. We can get another 12 disciples. He said, I'd take a bullet for you, Jesus. Yes, they did have bullets. See, we we need to watch our words. We do this often. We make promises to people without thinking. And when we we need to watch our words because the words that we say, it often sets the standard for our lives. See, Peter, he set the standard for his failure. Anything less than what he said would have been a failure for Jesus or for Peter, sorry. Anything less than what Peter said was failure. James 3 says this about if we can watch our words, it's like the rudder of a, of a ship. Even though it's tiny, even though it's small, it can turn the entire ship around, even though it's really big. And something as simple as watching our words can turn our entire life around. What if Peter would have said that night, he would have took a second just to think, all right, Jesus, I don't understand what you're saying, but tell me, what should I do? this night would have gone entirely different for Peter. Entirely different. Moving on. um, Later that night, they they leave the upper room where they're having the Last Supper, and they head to the Mount of Olives. And there, Jesus says, you guys, wait here, pray. I'm going to go over here and pray by myself. And then Jesus returns to him. And this is Matthew 26, uh, verse 40. And then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, what? Really? Really? He could not watch with me one hour. Watch and pray, lest you enter temptation. Jesus said to watch and pray so you don't enter temptation. So again, we see his pattern. He's he's warning him a second time here. But here he actually gives him something that he should be doing. He was also telling him to go and pray. You see that there's actually a direct connection between our failures and our prayer life and our time with God. There's a direct connection. So to stay out of the letdown, we need to strengthen yourself in prayer. And we see several examples of this in the Bible. Jesus was praying right that night. He prayed for Peter, even though Peter wouldn't pray for himself. Paul prays in Ephesians that we would be strengthened in our inner man. So prayer, time with God, time in prayer actually strengthens us. Proverbs 24.10 says, If you faint in the day of adversity, it's because your strength is small. And the amplified version of this says your strength is limited. You see, our strength becomes small when we don't pray. Our strength becomes limited to what you can do when you don't spend time with God. 
But when you do, when you do spend time with God, when you do spend time in prayer, you're inviting God into your situation. And what's too hard for God, right? Nothing. And think of this. That same night, Jesus, as he was about to do the very the hardest thing he would ever have to do, he to face the hardest thing he would ever have to face. Like he was in the garden, he was he was sweating because of the anxiety of going to the cross, right? He prayed that night, and the Bible says angels came and strengthened him. This is Jesus. How much more us need to how much more do we need to spend time with God and to pray to get strength from God if Jesus had to? So Jesus is saying, pray, get strength so you can withstand temptation. And that will work for any temptation, no matter what it is. Uh, if whatever you're dealing with, you pray, you spend time with God, um, he's going to strengthen you. I mean, even in the natural, like wh- whoever you hang out with, you start to become like them. So if you start hanging out with God, you're going to become like God. And you're going to have the strength to overcome. But Jesus here is actually referring to this, what he warned them about earlier. Remember, this is the second warning. So let's go back. We're going to read Luke 22 and verse 34 from the Amplified because I think it sheds a little more light. Simon, uh, Simon, listen. Satan has demanded permission to sift all of you like grain. But I have prayed especially for you, Peter, that your faith and confidence in me may not fail. That your faith and confidence in me may not fail. You see, the temptation here was that their faith and confidence in him would fail. The temptation was that Peter's confidence in him would start to dwindle. Because what happened shortly after this? The guards came into the garden. They arrested Jesus. They hauled him off. They took him to a trial. They beat him. And the disciples would scatter. And this is where I believe Peter entered into the downward spiral that I, to the letdown. Um, and it starts with doubt. Because really, when you think about what's the op- opposite of confidence, it's doubt. And when we got to put ourselves in Peter's shoes here, um, just the fact that Jesus would have been arrested would have been crazy to them. How many times was Jesus faced with, uh, with angry crowds, with crowds who wanted to stone him, throw him off a cliff, and he would walk right through the midst of them? Jesus was always one step ahead of every situation because God was with him. Just the fact that he was arrested would have been against everything the disciples knew about Jesus. And that's where Jesus was. So what would be going through your head? I mean, what were the disciples thinking? Is Jesus really everything that he said he was? Because all the good things he said don't really line up with what's happening right now. And a lot of us, you know, we're in those situations where the word of God says one thing, but we feel like we're in a, a situation that doesn't line up with that. And we don't understand And that's where Peter was. He was in a place where he didn't understand. He was confronted with doubt. Uh, The scriptures go on to say that he he followed Jesus at a distance. Even though he scattered, he got some courage back up, and he followed Jesus at a distance as they were leading him off. But his confidence was, was, was not there. And how many of us can say, like, you know, we're following Jesus, but are we really still confident in him? Like, has anyone been there where they're following Jesus and their confidence just seems low? I've been there. We've all been there. If you follow Jesus, like, you're going to get discouraged sometimes. What he calls us to do, uh, we can't do on our own without his strength. I think we've all been in this spot before. So Peter continues to follow him, and they go to the high priest's house, and they lead Jesus inside, and there they have a mock trial. They condemn him. They put a blindfold over him, and they begin to beat him. And they mock him, saying, prophesy who hit you. All the while, Peter is outside in the courtyard. He's actually sitting with the people who arrested Jesus. And he's sitting by the fire to stay warm. And he's got these, these, his confidence is shaken. And these people are coming up to him saying, hey, weren't you with Jesus? And he would say, no, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I mean, if your confidence in someone was shaken, how quick would you be to identify with that person, Right? So a second person says, no, I think I saw you in the garden with him. No, no, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. He's probably a bad liar. And, and this is where we pick up. But this is the third time. Uh, Luke 22, verse 59. Then after about an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, surely this fellow was with him, for he is Galilean. I'm going to stop right there. 
how, he knew he was Galilean because of his accent, the, the, way, the way he he spoke. He had the northerner accent, and um, they recognized that he that he was Galilean from that. But it just tells me that Peter was still talking, right? He wasn't watching his words still, and it just amazes me because. John is actually in the courtyard with him. The, the disciple John was in there as well. But we don't read anything about John happening from this event. Just Peter. I wonder why. So it goes on to say, so this is the third time he's been confronted. Now by this time, Peter would have to be getting uneasy. Like he better put on a show right now to get these people off his back. Right? Like when someone confronts you a few times, you want them off your back, you're going to start to get aggressive, you're going to start to get bold. So he, he spurts out, man, I do not know what you're saying. Leave me alone. Other, other gospels say that he began to swear and he began to curse. Like he's really being aggressive here. Like he's really laying it on so these people would leave him alone. Because remember, his confidence has been shaken. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord how he said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. You see, the downward spiral starts with doubt, but it leads to fear. When we doubt who God is in our lives, it leads to all kinds of fears. If we doubt that the Lord has provided for us, we'll fear lack. If we doubt his protection, then we'll fear harm. And ultimately, when you doubt who God is in any area, you'll fear who man thinks you are. And that's what happened to Peter, fear. You know, if Jesus couldn't even protect himself, how is he going to protect me? He let fear come in. So he lied to protect himself. And and we do this all the time in all all kinds of relationships or in all kinds of things. You know, in our workplace, in our marriages. You know, maybe you have the doubt forming that maybe my spouse doesn't love me the way they used to. So the fear sets in. And then when the mistake happens or a mess up happens, you lie, you protect to cover up that fear so that a doubt would not be realized. And if we do this often until it builds up and you know, it takes time. It doesn't usually happen right away where it backfires, but it backfires on us. And that's what happened to Peter. He, he, as he's spouting off, as he's, as he's getting aggressive and he's displaying this ugly side of him, the soldiers are transporting Jesus from the, from the inside across the courtyard. And by this time, his face would have been black and blue. It would have been swollen. It would have been bloodied. And he turns and looks at Peter. And I, and I don't believe that he looked at Peter with a condemning face, with like a how could you kind of face. But he actually looked at Peter with, a, with, with eyes of love and, and longing actually to go to Peter and to strengthen him and to encourage him. And that's what Peter saw. And when you, if you're face to face with Jesus, and you're looking at him with those eyes, how he just realized the depth of his failure. How could you not? So verse 62 says, Peter went out and wept bitterly. The downward spiral ends with, he wept bitterly. And I say it like that, I was thinking of a word like, oh, we could use like a word like despair. It ends with despair. But I feel like any word that I chose would cheat that moment right there for Peter, because this wept bitterly, it's the kind of weeping you would do at a funeral, you know, when, there's, when you know that there's no coming back. That's what was going on with Peter. And I feel like to fully even understand what Peter was going through at this moment, we got to realize that this was not Peter's first time coming face to face with his shortcomings, with his failures. The first time was when Jesus called him from being a fisherman to be a disciple. Peter said, Depart from me. I'm a sinful man. Look, Jesus, there's ugly things about me that you don't know about. You would be better off without me. But Jesus calls out the potential in him, and Peter follows. But this time is different. This time, Peter had spent three years with Jesus. He was with him on the road. He saw his miracles. He received the love of God. He was part of the teachings. He was part of the inner group. He heard things the other disciples didn't even get to hear. He saw things they they, they didn't even get to see. He was intimate with Jesus. He spent intimate time with Jesus. He should have known better. Jesus was his friend. The depth of his failure, just to know Jesus in that way and to fail him, crushed him. He let Jesus down. He let himself down. He failed. He wasn't who he thought he was. His very ideals, his very identity was shaken to its core. 
His dreams were shattered. The very thing that was in his heart to do, to go be a part of the kingdom of God, to bring about the greatest change the earth would ever see, to bring about the greatest transformation that would last for generations and generations to come, shattered, lost. See, Peter was counted out. Peter was counted out. And he should have known better. Peter should have known better. And this is where some of you are today. You know, you've ignored the warnings. You said things you regret. You didn't have the strength to resist. And you found yourself in the spiral down. And you're ready to give up on yourself. Or you feel like God has given up on you. And when you're at that place, there's only that one thing left to do. And that's return to him. You see, God's over your mistakes before it happens. The biggest thing he's concerned about is his connection with you. It's why he sent Jesus in the first place. He sent Jesus so that he can wipe away any roadblock, any, any stumbling block, so that you could go to God freely. That was his biggest concern was his relationship with you. But it's also the one thing that the devil does not want. He doesn't want you to be connected to God. He wants separation. He says he knows that when you're connected with God, when you're confident with God, that nothing will be impossible for you. And the Apostle Paul actually says that nothing can separate us from God's love. And that is except for when we choose to separate ourselves. See, God will not, you have a free will. God will not violate your free will. He created it that way. But nothing else is blocking him. There are no roadblocks. So go back to him, weaknesses and all, failures and all. He already knows all of your secrets and all of your shames. When you think about Adam and Eve in, in the garden, when they made their mistake, what did they do? They separated themselves from God. They hid from God. But God knew. God knows all, the, all their mistakes, all the shames. But despite those things, he is still jealous for you. And think of it this way. He wants to do a trade. He wants all of you for all of him. He wants all of our mistakes, our shortcomings, our attitudes, our selfishness, our pride, our greed. And he wants to give us all of his love, patience, kindness, protection, healing, joy, provision, anything good that you can think of. That's what he wants to give us. That's too good of a deal, right? That's too good of a deal. Why be separated from that? Why be separated from that? Return to him. Bring it all before him. And say, here I am, Lord, junk and all, I choose you. I thank you that you take me as I am and you make me as I ought to be. That's what Peter did. He returned to him. And we actually see Jesus does some things to actually help Peter return. Mark 16 and verse 7. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now this is an angel that, that Jesus had sent to his, to his tomb to tell to give this message to Peter and his disciples. He wanted Peter to know that he was not counted out. He wanted Peter to know that he was still part of the group. And then later, um, Jesus asked three times, one, one for every denial that, that Peter did, do you love me? And Peter would respond, yes, I love you. And Jesus said, go, do what I've called you to do. Do that thing that I originally put in your heart to do. See, Peter, we think, we think that our mistakes somehow count us out from doing the thing that God has put in our heart to do. But Jesus is saying, no, you still are in that right standing with me. Still go do what I've called you to do because I'm not holding your mistakes against you. Thank you. Peter thought he was counted out. Jesus still went after him. You guys, this story is in here for us. And he wants you to know that you're not counted out that you can still do that thing in your heart that's for, him to, for you to do. The last part is have confidence in him. Yes. Jesus is who he says he is. And this is the most important part. See, Peter came to a place where he no longer doubted who Jesus was in his life. He knew that he knew that he knew that Jesus was the Messiah, his risen Savior. He saw him. And nothing would ever again deter him from, from knowing that, not even death. And church history tells us that Peter actually died a martyr's death, but he would not, 
He would never again deny Jesus. Never again. And that's my question for you tonight, is do you know who Jesus is in your life? Do you really believe he is who he says he is? So with every head bowed, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, as the one who died for you so you could have a relationship with God, one that's not based on performance, but is based on love because he loved you. If you're that person and you want to know Jesus as your Savior, if you want to know that you're going to heaven, I want you to just slip your hand up for me. Thank you, Lord. There's another group here. And this is the group. Thank you. There's another group here. This is the group who thinks that they should have known better. And for some of us, you know, it's a lot easier to accept our second chance and forgiveness when we didn't know any better. When we didn't know Jesus, when we didn't have that intimate time with him, when we didn't experience his salvation, when we didn't experience his miracles in our life. But now that you have and you still failed, it's hard to believe that someone could love you that much to give you another chance. And if you're willing to believe it today, that just as Jesus sent his angels to his empty tomb to tell Peter, he sent me today to tell you that he has not given up on you. So if you're that person today, just slip up your hand. We're going to be praying for everybody. Thank you. I see that hand. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Let us pray this together. This is for the first group who wants to know Jesus. Lord Jesus, I have sinned. I ask for forgiveness. Come into my heart. Make me new. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. My life is no longer my own. I give it to you. Thank you, Lord. I want to pray for you. For those who who feel like they need another chance. You know, just as Peter was told by the angels to go back to his hometown and there he would meet with Jesus. I believe if you go back to your home, to your secret place, Jesus will meet with you there. And there he will strengthen you. Lord, I pray, give them boldness to approach you, Lord not because of their own, uh, their own merits, Lord, but because they are confident in what Jesus has done for them, that they could boldly approach your throne of grace. And Lord, I ask that you would break off any shame that has attached themselves to their life, Father, that they would be free from that, Father, that there would be no stumbling blocks before them, Lord, that they could come to you openly and know that you're going to accept them, mistakes and all, Father. Lord, I thank you that you've accepted them for who they are, and that you're changing them into who they need to be, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.